the entire time the officer had his hand on his belt, on not just on his belt, on the handle of his gun that was strapped to his belt. That was just absolutely horrifying to know that, you know, they were willing to take it that far and they were letting me know. Even their own admission, a fault, an apology of their own administration or, or management, they dismissed that and they deepened the wound by appealing the verdict. During that time, it was, it was just completely, complete humiliation. All the verbal interactions were, were hostile and, you know, just a typical authoritarian tone. A wave of emotions hit me like a tsunami. I, I just, I, I could not articulate what is happening. In my mind, it's like, you know what, Kirk? I gotta make a stand. I gotta be able to do something to help somebody that, that's not able to fight because I, I, I knew I was in a position to fight. My position was, I got a big mouth and I'm gonna use it. My name is Leonard Anderson, and I hail from the historic community of Upper Hammers Plains here in Nova Scotia, Canada. How y'all doing? My name is Kirk Johnson. I'm from North Preston, but I grew up in Dartmouth. My name is Jossie Simons. I grew up in Cole Harbor, Nova Scotia, but my family has an over 400 year lineage in this province. I am a proud African Nova Scotian, eighth generation Canadian, 19th pastor of the historic Emmanuel Baptist Church here in Upper Hammers Plains. I am a husband, a father of three, and uh, it's been an amazing journey to partner with this community. I'm a retired veteran, uh, commissioned officer in the Canadian Armed Forces, and I currently serve as lecturer of racial justice and leadership in the Faculty of Theology at Acadia University. That's me. My mom's family is from Cherry Brook in East Preston, and my father's family is from Digby and Hammonds Plains and the North End area of Halifax. I'm a professional boxer. And I was a great amateur boxer also. Uh, I'm a son of Gary Johnson Sr. and Violet Frazier Johnson. And I have two wonderful parents. I have two brothers. And I have two places that love me. North Preston and also Dartmouth. I'm an educator. I am a counselor and therapist. I'm a consultant, and I've been a human rights activist since the age of 13. April 8th of 1998, uh, me and my cousin was driving past McMack Mall, and we looped back around on Main Street across from uh, Tim Hortons. Police stopped us, and start telling me that I don't have the right insurance, that I don't have registration, that my car is illegal. I kept showing them my insurance. I uh, kept showing them my registration. I kept showing them all the ID that I had. And he was getting irritated. I uh, was getting rude. He was walking away from me. Wasn't accepting none of my, my information I gave him. Uh, it was me and my cousin were together, and I just told him, I said, listen, I said, you know, here's the information right here, and he would just turn his back on me, being rude on purpose, and wouldn't accept it. And I just told him, I said, listen, uh, I don't want no trouble with you guys, but if you, because he was threatening me, saying he's going to take my car, and I said, if, if you take my car, you and I is going to have a big, big, big problem the assistant manager of Sobeys. During the proceedings, uh, the same woman that approached her and accused her admitted her own wrongdoing, admitted that she acted inappropriately. Listen, you got the choir singing, because finally there was an acknowledgement. But what, what caused ripples in our community it was when Sobeys decided to dismiss even their own admission 
a fault, an apology of their own administration or, or management. They dismissed that and they deepened the wound by appealing the verdict. January, I believe the month was, and it was during the morning hours, probably around 10 o'clock. But it's typical for people where I worked to go across the street to the local coffee shop and it's directly across the street from where I work. And I work on the corner of Goddard and on Cornwallis. That's where I was working at the time. On that date, some of my staff mates were going to get a coffee from the local coffee shop across the street. And I was behind them, you know, maybe about 30 or 40 seconds behind them. They entered the coffee shop. And um, as I was about to enter the coffee shop, there were two police officers that were on their way down the street and you know, took the time to stop me. After there were three colleagues in front of me that just happened to be white and um, nothing was said to them. And I, and I also asked them, did you see the people that crossed the street prior to me? And you know, they seemed to be invisible. I ended up going into the coffee shop, getting myself a coffee, got a small black coffee, exited the coffee shop, walk up to the corner of Gardegen and Cornwallis to cross within the lines of the um, crosswalk and proceeded to go up to my, to my office where I work. I go up to my office, I'm working for maybe about 20 minutes or so, and then I get a uh, message from reception or from the commissioners actually telling me that the police were in the lobby asking for for me, well, the way they described the man, they described me as a black man in a toque. So I went down there and as um, soon as I went down there, it was um, the entire, the, the environment was completely hostile. So here we are on Gardegen Street. This is where I jaywalked, um, just from here to there, literally, to the nook on Gardegen, it's called. So I went in there, got a black coffee. Before I was able to enter, I was intercepted by the police had a brief lecturing conversation with them and came out after getting my coffee, walked down Gardner Street. When I was in the crosswalk, I did notice the officers were way down Gardner Street, way past the Mi'kmaq Friendship Center. I'd say almost two blocks down. So I don't see how they seen me in the crosswalk for almost, from almost two blocks down and be able to see whether I was in or out of the crosswalk. I was in the crosswalk for the record, but for some reason they doubled back. So they definitely got their steps in that day. They actually circled back around and then followed me into my place of work. You know, 40 years, as long as I've been alive, there's always been high foot traffic on, you know, God of the and North End area in, in general whether my rights were violated because of my race. It turned into a complete circus about whether I was in the lines on the way back, all the logistics on whether they could see me, how many steps it took me to get from the nook to the corner of Gardegen Street and Cornwallis. Just a bunch of irrelevant things that had little to nothing to do with um, my human rights being violated. You're just not gonna take a car that I worked hard for just because you want to do it and you're so-called hiding behind the law. He was brave enough to take my car. But before that, I just said to him, I said, well, you need to give me your badge number and your name. And he was yelling it to me. And I said, no, I, I don't want you to yell it to me. I said, I want you to write it down. So I folded up my insurance card. I folded it up, put it on the back, and I gave it to him. I said, well, write it on, on here. So he wrote his badge number, 454 Michael Sanford down. I said, well, I'll see you in court. He said, he don't care. I said, cool. About two and a half years later, we seen him at, the, at my lawyer's office. We, we had a meeting or what have you to try to straighten out the situation. The first thing he said was, Kirk never had insurance on him. But how didn't I have insurance on me if you signed your name on the back of my insurance card? Uh, that's how everything started to go on right there. They appealed, and, and I just remember being shocked, angered. A wave of emotions hit me like a tsunami. I, I just, I, I could not articulate what is happening. How are you, Sobeys, a prominent, successful business in our country, 
in deliberately dismissing justice, not acknowledging discrimination, and really crying bias. They appealed on the basis that they felt they were being unfairly treated. They were crying bias, and it, it did not fall on me. It did not, it was not lost on me, I should say. We began writing letters. As a church, I was commissioned and empowered by our board of directors to take a stand. And uh, we, as a church, we're going to start by writing letters to the CEO, to the president of Sobeys, that in this, the international decade for people of African descent, we would choose to make our mark by discrediting the principles of, of, of justice and equality. Shame, shame. And so we began writing. We began appealing to our sister churches, those of like mind, those of move with compassion, those that want to stand on the right side of justice. We asked for allies to join us in public demonstration. They were looking for any excuse to arrest me on that day. It wasn't about giving me a ticket for jaywalking. It was about, can we get anything on this guy? Because it seems like a trophy. During that time, it was, it was just completely, complete humiliation. All the verbal interactions were, were hostile and, you know, just a typical authoritarian tone and, um, the belittling and the um, intentional humiliation in what clearly was my place of work. The entire time the officer had his hand on his belt, on not just on his belt, on the handle of his gun that was strapped to his belt. So that was just absolutely horrifying to know that, you know, they were willing to take it that far and they were letting me know that you know, they can you know, end my life, or they have the trump card right on the side of their hip. I'm just glad to, to have survived that situation, and I'm happy to be here and have, have represented myself. I went to my lawyer, because my lawyer was my boxing lawyer. Like, we, we did stuff in boxing, me and my father. So we hired, we went to, it was automatic for us to go to him because he was my paid lawyer. So we went to him, and I told him the next day, I said, listen, they took my car. <laughs> I want my car. So we, we went over to the police department. Uh, an officer there signed a letter for me to go get my car right away. He, he smiled at, at it. After I showed him my registration, he smiled and just shook his head and signed it and said, go get your car. I don't know why your car was taken in the first place, he said, but go get it. And then, <clears throat> then me and my lawyer would start working on it, start having meetings. The very next day, I went to the police department and talked to uh, Officer Bell or what have you. I said to him, I said, my cousin and I, we need an apology. And he said, we don't give apologies. But he, he tried to give me a $69 check for the towing fee, but he, he, but he wouldn't, he said, we don't give apologies. I said, listen, you don't give apologies? I said, we can do this in your little office. We don't have to make it public, but he's gonna apologize. He said, no, we don't do apologies. I said, okay. I shook his hand, I gave him the $69 check back, shook his hand, I said, I'll see you. And it was just stuff like that. It was just balling up, balling up. And every time I did something that was right, and that was more on the friendly side and more on the side of not having trouble. It was just little stuff like that that showed me that they know that they're wrong, but they don't care. And in my mind, it's like, you know what, Kirk? I gotta make a stand. I gotta be able to do something to help somebody that, that's not able to fight because I, I knew I was in a position to fight. My position was I got a big mouth and I'm gonna use it. I found the resources to file a human rights complaint online. I knew that I was treated unfairly, humiliated that day. My body and my mind were, were in, a, in a really negative place after that incident. At that time, I printed the forms off and my initial complaint was probably handwritten. And then I followed up with um, so, uh, some typed documents with a lot more details. but. It's an online process, and um, all you have to do is have the, the documents and be able to tell your story. The outcome of the claim was that, yes, Michael Sanford uh, discriminated against me because I was black, and that meant a lot to me. It, it, it opened the door. And first and foremost, it made me be just like my role model, Martha Luther King fighting justice, you know, fighting for my justice. That that opened that door. 
And then it allowed me to be able to show some of my people, some of my peers, that yes, if, if you take your time, if you be patient, you can go ahead, you can fight, and we can possibly win. Because before the case, while the case was going on, I had a lot of my people saying, Kirk not gonna win that. Oh, them people gonna do this, them people gonna do that. And I was just telling them, I said, they ain't gonna do it because I got something. I got this man right, written signature, and his claim was gonna be Kirk had no insurance. But you can't say I never had no insurance because you wrote your signature on my on the back of my insurance. But he didn't know that though. I won the case, and I just right there, and then I just knew that something, even though it took a long time, five years of coming back and forth, dealing with it, going through meetings after meetings, people shut me down saying, no, you're you're right and he's right. And I was telling them, no, how can both of us be right? But yet I get punished or whatever. So after winning the case, it just opened the doors that we can build build off of what I did. And years later, you know, every time something goes on, I hear my case mentioned all the time. So I guess it's doing exactly what I wanted it to do. When one suffers, we all suffer. And there is a role for community common unity. We are better together. There is strength in numbers. And so we were taught from that day on to show up intentionally, to show up deliberately, to be an ally, to be an advocate, you know, because anyone can talk the talk, but you need to walk. People just have to be aware that um, it's a long journey. It may be a lonely journey and you don't necessarily need an expert or a lawyer, all you have to do is tell what happened to you, you know, and if the facts prove that you were treated differently based on your race or one of the protected characteristics, then you will um, most likely be successful. Some atrocities can happen to you, and if you don't have people beside you saying, you know, go ahead with it, we're there for you, and what was done to you wasn't your fault, is wrong, everybody don't have my intuition. They don't have the intuition that, that that I have, like, I knew I, was, I wasn't wrong. I knew I didn't do anything wrong. But at the same time, I wasn't gonna allow them to just blow this off and, and punish me for nothing and blow this off. So we have to support those who have this type of situation. We do need the support and need to support everybody and uh, need some financial support also because it is draining. And I was in a good position, so it didn't drain me, but to a normal person, it would drain financially. And if I may issue a challenge, it would be this, that we can grow weary and well-doing. We have to fight the good fight of faith. So may we never stop working for a safer, equal, more equitable, fair society. We are better together. We sing it all the time in the Black National Anthem. Facing the rising sun, our new day has begun. Let's march on till victory is won. We gotta fight. We have to fight the good fight of faith.